Sound of Money with Santosh Seru. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Sound of Money. Well, on this episode of The Sound of Money, we have a guest joining us from the US. And uh, well, with me on the show is Pratik Kodyal. Uh, now, Pratik is a founder and the managing partner of Tapasya Investments. And we'll get to know more about uh, Tapasya from Pratik in a short while from now. Now, he has been having a fantastic hands-on experience in retail, in technology, in insurance and consumer products. And more importantly, now setting up a fund and we'll talk more about all that and more on this episode of The Sound of Money. Hi, Pratik, and uh, welcome to The Sound of Money. Hi, Santosh, and thanks a lot for having me here. So, Pratik, uh, you've had excellent experience across various industries. Uh, what leads you to get into a fund and at this stage in time? Sure. So, uh, I've been very, very passionate uh, about investing all through my life. Uh, and in fact, I have a longer investing career than my professional career, if you will. Um, so the way it actually occurred is as I was growing up in Bombay or Mumbai, um, uh, the investing bug uh, uh, bit me. And so back in, in the day when I was in the 10th grade, um, 1991, um, mm -hmm. um, we had the Harsha Mehta days, but basically there was a big bull run. The economy was opening up, et cetera. And uh, living in Mumbai, yeah, there was just a lot of talk and chatter around stocks and making money. And there was everyone making money in the stock market. Uh, so, so in, in those days, I basically started investing yeah, using my parents' money. Um, unfortunately, uh, I ended up making a lot of losses. So my first mm -hmm. uh, few journeys of investment have largely been where I invested money. I made a lot of losses uh, um, uh, just because it was, it was very euphoric at that point in time. And I didn't really know much about investing outside of wanted to, wanting to be rich. And so kind of started there, gave my tuition fees. And then I really identified that I have to start learning about investing as opposed to just investing and putting in money based on what others think about. So that's where that journey started. I've always been very passionate about investing. From there on, as I, as I, I graduated and, and moved to the US over time, I actually worked in the UK as well. I've always been passionate, as I said, about investing and started investing small dollars at that point. Didn't really have a whole lot of money. But I came across Warren Buffett, um, had heard about him, really not read much about him. But I came across Warren Buffett, started reading a lot about investing, understanding the key principles, understanding value investing. I started reading about um, um, investing from other people as well, such as Peter Lynch uh, and so on and yeah. so forth. And so eventually, um, that's what made me uh, get into it full time. Um, and, and so I was actually in a professional career, as you talked about, um, uh, working as an officer for a Fortune, Fortune 500 company for quite some time. And, and um, I wanted to do this uh, as a full-time role. And that's yeah. where I finally made the plunge uh, earlier this year. Okay. So you mentioned uh, Warren Buffett and, uh, you know, you mentioned about his value investing. Tell us a little more about value investing. And, you know, as an, an, for an average listener, like what does he or she take? What are the takeaways for him or her? Yeah. So, so there is a very specific definition of value investing. And the father of value investing is called as uh, Benjamin Graham. So I'm going to use that definition, but I think value investing at the end of the day, the way I think about it and actually talked about by Charlie Munger, who's a partner for Warren Buffett, yeah. is um, uh, all intelligent investing is value investing. And I thoroughly believe that's the case. Now, back in the day, as, as Benjamin Graham uh, uh, defined it, it was largely around buying companies below their intrinsic value. And so what do I mean by that? So, so if you have the ability to value a, a company, um, and, and so I'm just going to call it that valuation is $100 million or $100, whatever the case may be. And we yeah. can talk about how do you evaluate uh, um, um, a company. But if the, the company is at the valuation of $100 million or $100, uh, the intent of value investor largely as defined was to try and buy that company for $50 or $50 million, right? Basically get it for uh, $50 uh, dollars to the $100, if you will, mm. or 50 cents to the dollar. So that's largely... Yeah. Uh, kind of what value investing has been. But I think the paradigm of value investing or has changed over time with the intent of buying good companies and holding them over a long period of time with the goal of trying to buy it at fair prices or lower than their intrinsic value. Okay. So so coming to your fund, your hedge fund, right? First of all, uh, let's go to the basics. You launched a fund, which is a hedge fund. Talk a yes. lot more about hedge fund, what exactly it is. And then we also get into your specifics of uh, the one just launched very recently. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question because um, I, I, especially as I talk to a lot of my friends and colleagues, uh, they're not necessarily very sure of what a hedge fund is. So I'm yeah. going to kind of break it out into five different types of funds and then I'll talk about hedge fund in more yeah. detail. But if you think about different types of funds, I think we can categorize them into five funds. And so from that perspective, you've got the venture capital, so VC funds, you've got mm. the private equity, P, you've got hedge funds, you've got um, uh, real estate and you've got debt. Okay, so I'm going mm -hmm. to define each one of them a little bit in yeah. detail and then um, spend more time on the hedge fund. So, so if you think about venture capital, you're primarily talking about startups. They are not listed uh, securities. Um, these, are, these are companies where these VCs or venture capital funds uh, come in and, and, and start investing um, uh, with the intent of eventually uh, making a lot more money as the startup uh, does well. So that's your VC. The private equity is very similar in that context. But the only difference is VC comes in a lot earlier than the private equity funds, if yeah. you will. The hedge fund primarily deals with listed securities. So all publicly listed securities are what a hedge fund does. So in the context mm -hmm. of stocks, um, it's actually listed on the stock market post the IPO. That's where a hedge fund typically trades. It can also trade in other areas as options and so on and so forth. But think about publicly listed securities. Similarly, if you think about real estate, they invest in real estate funds and then uh, or real estate. And then you've got debt funds, which largely take money from people and give loans to, to the ones who need it. Now, in the construct of how it works for, for most people who may not be aware of it, it's largely all of these funds have the same construct, which is pooling in money from different investors and investing yeah. that money into organizations to eventually um, uh, make a profit of that uh, over a period of time. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to your specific hedge fund, right, the one that you've just launched, uh, who, who is your target investor? What kind of investors you're looking for? And then the second question is about what are the kind of investments you're looking at eventually and the returns maybe? Sure. So let me uh, address the returns piece first in terms of what the goal of it is. And then I'll touch upon the target investor just a minute in a minute. So as far as my goal is concerned, uh, it's quite a simple goal, uh, um, which is hard to get, but simple to define, which is basically beating the market. The market is defined as S&P 500. So mm -hmm. that's the, the, the broad market of five, five stocks, five and five stocks in the US. And, and the goal of the hedge fund is to beat that uh, index, if you will, over, over the long term. Long term defined as at least three plus years, if you will, in my context. So that's primarily that in terms of, of the strategy around uh, the hedge fund. Um, um, it, it, the, 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 it, it, is, it frankly invests across the globe. So think about um, uh, US, India, China, um, investments in uh, South Africa, Europe, et cetera, right? So it's a global yeah. fund. Um, hmm. uh, the goal is long-term. So, so again, investing with a long-term horizon. Um, uh, the intent is to identifying companies that have uh, uh, um, an economic moat, if you call it that. So, so basically hmm. a durable competitive advantage, right? So companies that have a durable competitive advantage, so uh, that stays over a long period of time, have a, has a fairly uh, uh, large growth trajectory, growth trajectory, and I'm talking about revenue growth over time yeah. that mm. uh, can be identified, cash flows that can be identified. So that's largely the strategy around uh, where to invest. The why to invest, if you think about it, right? I mean, in, into the fund, it's primarily around a few topics here. I mean, the first piece is uh, the alignment of interest. And, and so what I mean by that is a majority of my uh, uh, net worth is being invested in the hedge fund. It's very mm. unlike many hedge funds that are run in the US. There are about 8,000 hedge funds that run mm. in the US. And many of the hedge fund managers actually don't have much of their money invested mm. in the hedge fund they run, yeah. right? And so, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, the second one is, is around like the, why invest, right? I mean, I have very deep understanding in the businesses. So I have a finance understanding as well as a business understanding. And so that helps me kind of evaluate organizations a lot better. The third in the context of why invest is primarily around the fee structure. So for those who may not be familiar with hedge funds, the, it's typically called a 220 model in the US. A two, two actually is the management fee. So regardless of how the hedge fund performs, um, uh, there's a 2% management fee that gets charged. Um, and then there's a 20% performance fee. So over a certain threshold, there's usually a 20% performance fee. So the client takes or the investor takes 80%, the, the fund manager takes 20%. In my case, what I have done actually is I'm using the, I'm, there is zero management fee. So the investor mm. is actually not making money. I do not make any money. The other piece is that it, it has a 6% uh, 
um, threshold. So what I mean, or hurdle rate as it's defined in the hedge fund industry. So unless the investor makes 6%, I do not make a single penny, mm. right? And then it is 25, 75. So 75% for the investor, 25% uh, for myself. So it's exactly based on the Warren Buffett uh, uh, principles or Warren Buffett partnership that he had uh, started back in the late 50s. Um, mm. So that's that's primarily kind of the why invest, if you will, a little more about my, yeah. my hedge fund. And then in, in the context of what to expect, um, uh, primarily around... Um, concentration. So that's one big part for me. So in order to beat the market, I think it is very important to, to have a concentrated fund. It's very hard to actually beat the market by a very diversified portfolio. And this is a very uh, interesting topic, and we can certainly talk about it more in this call or, or another. But uh, the industry largely talks about diversification, but it's very, very hard to beat the market if you have a diversified portfolio. So in my case, it's going to be a very concentrated portfolio. I've had great success doing that. And my view, and Bill Hackman, Hackman, who's a big investor or head fund manager as well, um, has talked about it, which I completely agree to, is the fact that if it, why would you invest in an idea between 11 and 20 when you can invest in an idea between 1 and 10, right? Yeah. I mean, there is no reason to do that. I mean, you have suboptimal yeah. uh, returns when you do it. So it's going to be a concentrated portfolio. The other aspect is the turnover, right? One of the biggest hits that people take is the tax, right? I mean, we all deal mm. with it. Uh, in yeah. our professionals' lives. But even in the investing life, what people sometimes forget is the impact of tax. And so, so it's going to be a very low turnover uh, portfolio, if you will, which hence kind of avoids the implications of tax, which is largely the way I think about it is a 20%, 30%, whatever you want to consider it, uh, free loan from the government, right? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, to, to use as almost leverage in that sense. Yeah. So, so that's how I think about it. Now, coming back to the other question you had in terms of who is my target investor, uh, the way I look at it is, again, uh, the way the hedge fund is set up, it's primarily for accredited investors. So there is a certain mm. de definition of what an accredited investor is in the US or qualified yeah. investors. So there's a certain definition for that. We can touch upon it. So mm. they largely consider them high net worth individuals. Uh, the minimum investment is $50,000 for the hedge fund. So, so that's uh, the target audience. But more importantly, mm -hmm. the way I'm looking at it is individuals who are comfortable investing in the stock market, right? So these, yeah. these are largely the target audience. So I'm not looking at individuals who are not comfortable investing in the stock market because the way I think about it is uh, they need to sleep, uh, sleep well, right? I mean, if they, yeah. they are uncomfortable uh, sleeping when their, their portfolio moves up and down by, uh, plus minus, yeah. call it two to three percent or whatever. Plus minus twenty, yeah. thirty percent given the time yeah. of the year. Um, uh, this is not the place to be, and in my opinion, not the stock market, not an hedge fund, or whatever the case may be. So, so that's my target audience: so accredited investors who are comfortable investing in the stock market, whatever their their desired um, 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 ratio of investing may be in that sense. Mm. And, and you mentioned about uh, long-term investment. So, what is the kind of ballpark uh, number of years one should look forward to? You know, if they're do you stay invested? Yeah. So the way I look at it and what I tell my investors is, is evaluate me at least three years plus. It's very yeah. hard to kind of talk about from a long-term standpoint, anything yeah. below that. My preference yeah. personally is five years. I have held stocks for eight, 10, 12. My longest yeah. stock I've held actually is 20 years. I don't expect everyone to do that. I mean, there's yeah. a reason why people invest, which is primarily at a later point in time, they want more money, right? And so yeah. I get that there's a need for the for money. But yeah. um, from my perspective, I at least expect them to be three plus years. Okay. So, you know, the next question I have for you is uh, the timing of you launching this hedge fund, right? At a time when it's inflation, yeah. hopefully under control, you have a lot of talk about recession globally and geopolitically, the world is possibly, you know, really a hot place. Uh, and, and is this the right time for an investor to invest or maybe even for a hedge fund and a newbie like you to get into hedge fund? So, yeah. so your views? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'm kind of going to break it up into three parts here um, uh, to address or answer your question. So the first part is in terms of what is going on in the macro environment, right? And macro is really important because it does have an impact on how the organizations perform. So I'm not going to undermine the impact of macro. And I do look at it, but I'm a bottoms up investor. So my investment decision is not based on macro conditions. So there is no implication of macro conditions on my investment decision. So what I look at, as I've talked about it, I look at the companies, I understand what the intrinsic value is, I have a margin of safety. And so what that means is largely, 
let's say the, the company is worth hundred dollars. I, I feel that it's 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 worth hundred dollars. If, but if it's available for 50, 60, 70, I feel a lot more com comfortable because that's higher probability of me winning than losing, right? So, so that's how I look at it, regardless of what's going on around me. And so I, I think more micro, I think more, more about the company and bottoms up approach mm -hmm. as compared to what's, what's out there from a macro standpoint. Sure, the, the other aspect is my long-term thinking, right? So, so macro does have an impact on quarterly performance once in a while, but as Warren Buffett has talked about, right? If you think about, <clears throat> if you think about investing, I mean, you, you shouldn't be so concerned about a particular quarter in that sense. And, yeah. and as macro conditions do worsen at times, or uh, there's a contraction in, in, the, uh, in the GDP, et cetera, you'll have implications as naturally all of us do. And, and so that's not something that bothers me. So that's part one of your answer. Um, the the other, other aspect on the, in the context of macro, is this the right time or the wrong time, right? Uh, uh, there, there's one aspect of it, which is timing. I don't believe in timing the market. Um, I, I think it's largely around time in the market, right? How much time mm -hmm. you spend in the market is actually more yeah. important than timing the market. Now, as far as timing is concerned, sure, arithmetically, you'll actually get a great number when you see if you time the market perfectly, but there are very, very few people, if at all any, I do not know of any, who can actually time the market perfectly, right? So, so yeah, you can draw charts and kind of uh, uh, take two points in the chart and say that uh, this is what it would be. So, so I, as I said, uh, it doesn't really bother me. The, the other aspect to that question is, as far as macro conditions, um, ability to invest, ability to predict. I don't think we have great people predicting uh, uh, a macro impacts. Yeah. Sure, there's geopolitical impacts, there's inflation impacts, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they're very, very connected in different ways, very, very hard to predict what's going on. Uh, there are very few people, if any, who can be very accurate all the time in predicting what it is. So, so investing based on that is very, very difficult, um, in my opinion. And so I don't do that at all. Um, now, now, coming back to hedge fund itself and starting a hedge fund at this time, I mean, again, I was very passionate about it. I, I, I was very successful in my own investment uh, uh, in my personal portfolio, et cetera. So, so I wanted to do this. Uh, but if you think about it, there are few times um, in our lifetime where markets get beat uh, really bad, right? I mean, you had the 2000.com uh, bust, yeah. that you, if you will. You had the 2008 yeah. uh, crisis that there was. Um, yeah. and, and this seems like one, right? I mean, there are, are companies that have fallen 80, 90%, uh, great companies that have fallen 40, 50%, right? I mean, um, 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 and they've not really changed a whole lot. Maybe macro problems. But they're yeah. not, and I'm not talking Meta or Facebook in this case. I'm actually talking mm. about Amazon. I'm talking about Apple. I'm talking about Google, right? Yeah. There may be a little bit here and there, but at the end of the day, those companies are as strong as they've ever been. But they're just available at a significant discount or what was available a few days earlier or a month earlier yeah. at, at great yeah. discounts, actually 40%, 30% cheaper than what yeah. they are as of uh, yesterday. So um, yeah. I think that some of these opportunities were going against the grain or going against what the herd is saying and being mm. right can change your, your, your outcome very dramatically. These opportunities mm. come usually once or twice in a lifetime. This could be one of them. Absolutely. So Pratik, one last question before we leave. Uh, you, you, you're stepping into, you know, from a professional career now into as an investor or, you know, managing a fund, right? And there yes. are so many, and especially when I'm talking of in, in, in a very uh, general sense, a startup career. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you come across a lot. Somebody inspired you and you said, OK, it's time for me to get into it. So what what were your initial uh, challenges when, when it comes to a startup career? And how do you see the startup career or a startup scene across the globe and more so in the US? Sure. That is a great question here. I mean, um, in terms of uh, let me tell you about my journey and then I'll touch upon a little bit on the larger perspective as it relates to startups. Um, I think I think uh, as I was thinking about it, um, uh, there's of course a lot of individuals, especially in the context of hedge funds, there's a lot of fees involved to get started, right? You have legal fees, yeah. you've got um, all kinds of things going on when you start a hedge fund. And, and so there are a lot of naysayers typically, as you can think about it, just because of either the investment, individuals don't do it as much. You usually have large houses. How do you compete with them? Like this is yeah. a yeah. myriad of things that come up uh, um, as, as potential challenges. So challenges yeah. are probably true. Uh, but um, as many founders are, they, they work through those, they're muscle through those issues or challenges, and so did I, right? I mean, and 
again, not, not very unique in that sense. There are a lot of founders who do that. I'm sure they get all those issues. I think in the US, it's a little easier to start new companies relative to my experiences, if you will, in India. But outside of that, I think, I think um, um, uh, those are the, the challenges, if you will. Mm. The second piece, again, I think is the fact of like uh, uh, leaving your job, which you have a constant yes. cash flow, to kind yes. of moving into a startup where, where obviously the cash flow is hindered. Um, um, I was fortunate enough to build a little bit of a buffer to kind of uh, uh, continue that and, and not have an impact on family and so on and so forth. Hmm. Um, hmm. So those are some of the things that I had to deal with. Um, and I think uh, so far so good, it will find out what happens in the coming years. Now, in the context of general startups, uh, given that I have a lot more time that I, uh, than I do, uh, than I did when I was working, I've actually joined a angel investing group um, um, as a part of the core team, uh, in fact, um, and they probably wanted me because I have the ability to, to evaluate companies and so on and so forth, right? So yeah. um, uh, it's called a tight Dallas Angels and, and uh, it's quite interesting, I think, in the US and I think even more exciting, uh, I, I was in India recently, I think actually more exciting in India uh, right now, but it's, it's, it's uh, very exciting in the US as well. Um, I mean, that's just a myriad of problems we all face, right? Our, our problems um, that uh, smart individuals with, the, um, uh, with technology are able to solve for. So I think, yeah. I think uh, the startup industry has a long way to go um, and it has been really good in India uh, or in the US. And I think India is just uh, uh, going to skyrocket um, in, in the coming days. Um, I mean, there'll be a little bit of turbulence which we are seeing at this point in time with interest rates going up, um, uh, funding being squeezed a little bit and, and maybe that, that may continue for another six months a year, year and a half, whatever the time frame may be. But I don't expect that to continue for life. So, and what I, I, I really think that, that founders are extremely resilient and, and determined uh, to move forward. So personally, yeah. uh, I feel that the great uh, uh, startups and our founders do not necessarily wait for a perfect environment for them to start the company, right? They just kind of muscle through all the issues mm. and challenges they have and, and come up with and make companies like an Amazon as an example, right? Yeah. I mean, um, um, so so I, I think there's just a lot of bright things to come in, in the future. I'm very, very optimistic about it. Absolutely. On that very, very optimistic note, uh, Pratik Kodial, founder and managing partner with uh, Tapasya Investments. Thank you. All the best for you, for your uh, career and your, you know, Thanks, your new endeavor. Most Bye -bye. And well, with that, we come to the end of this episode of The Sound of Man. We'll be back with another episode very shortly. At this point in time, from me, Santosh Sirur and Pratik Kodial, thanks again for joining it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. with Santosh Seru.